glory, God, to rest upon us, to move in us and through us. Lord, I ask you to touch our immerse visitors. There's about 50 of them. I ask you to put your hand on them, even tonight, Lord, as they go home tomorrow. Mark them in a fresh and a special way tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Bless you. Shine, Lord, shine. The light of your face. Shine, Lord, shine. The light of your face. Mm, shine. The light, the light of your face. Shine, Lord, shine. The light of your face. Oh. Come and shine. The light from the fire in your eyes, a burning love, affection for your bride. Shine, Lord, shine. The light of your face. Shine. He's like rain. 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 He's like r
No longer at a distance A real man we can know Trust nearer Trust nearer oh, The light of the world We have to know this man oh, no. Your love is 
Show us what is like. Show us what is like. Open our eyes. Show us what is like. We have to know. Show us what is like. Tell us, tell us. Show us what is like. Enlighten our hearts. Show us what. exactly how I feel and I can't begin to tell you what your love has meant I'm lost for words is there a way to show this passion in my heart how can I express This is my desire to pour my love on you like oil upon your feet, like wine for you to drink, like water from my heart. I pour my love on you, the praise is like perfume. I lavish mine on you to every drop it's gone. I'll pour my love on you. I don't know how to say exactly.
sake of love, all for the sake of unhindered fellowship and communion with the triune God. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Father. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming and revealing the Father and the Son to us. We love you. We came to pour our love on you. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, worship team. Let's remain standing for a moment, if you would. Let's just take a minute just to greet the folks around you. Just reach your hand out and say, hello, my name is. If you want the teaching notes and you don't have them, the hard copy, wave your hand. There's always a few who don't have them. Andy. <laughs> There's a few up here. Just keep your hand, wave your hand. You'll get the hard copy if you want them. And just wave your hand if you want them. They've tried to find you. There's, there's this lady up here. Sister Thomas. <laughs> Let's go ahead and have a seat. Let's go ahead and get started. Hello, Maribel.
just want to speak a blessing over the about 50 that are with us from the Immerse that's been here this week. And let's just welcome them. Well, I mean, we're kind of welcoming them, and they're leaving tomorrow morning, but better late than never. <laughs> Father, we just ask you, as we open our heart for the Word of God, you would come and teach us. You would speak to us. You would mark our hearts, Lord, by the Holy Spirit. And I ask that our friends in the Immerse program this week, that this would be a time, a shift in the Spirit with new clarity confirming your direction and assignments to them in a clear way. You would tenderize their heart and give them new confidence to engage with your heart in a deeper way. And I ask you for a blessing over them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, tonight we're looking at session seven on intimacy with the Trinity in John chapter 14. And most of you are aware where the plan is to do about 50 to 100 messages. I don't really know the number, but for about a, a one or two years on John 13 to 17, just verse by verse, line by line, not getting in a hurry. And we're on session nine of John 14, our next semester, well, John 15, then the next semester, John 16, then the next semester, John 17. And we'll kind of come back around and pick up John 13 because we didn't start with that. And so I'm going to give just a quick review of the opening command that Jesus gave in John chapter 14. He commanded them, and this is a very important and practical command, to not allow trouble to dominate their heart. Because there's, as I've said every week, there's a human responsibility and a human dynamic involved in us doing our part of resisting troubling thoughts that trouble our emotions and bringing our mind into alignment with the truths and the promises that Jesus sets forth here in John 13 to 17. Well, really the whole Bible, but he's saying, I want you to take the words I'm telling you, the truths, bring them into conversation with me, resist the troubled heart that's a, that is like a storm that just runs, uh, rages in the minds and the hearts of, of many, many believers. The Lord says, if you will resist it and realign your heart and mind with my promises that I'm giving you in these five chapters, and again, the whole word of God, verse 27, I will give you supernatural peace. I will calm the storm if you do your part. Paragraph B, one of Jesus' primary themes in John chapter 14, he wanted to reveal what the Father was like, but secondly, very important, he wanted to reveal how God's people should relate to the Father. That's a, a very important theme. He says, I want you to relate to the Father in the way that I'm relating to the Father in my humanity. As a man filled with the Holy Spirit. Of course, Jesus is more than that. He's fully God. And what's really uh, happening, and I just love to say this sentence. I say it every time. We are called as believers to participate in the family dynamics that occur in the Trinity. The way the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit interact, there's dimensions of that that the redeemed are called to participate in. Not, not every dimension, but many dimensions. And Jesus here in John chapter 14, we've covered this in session 7 and session 8. We're now in session 9. He was describing his relationship to the Father as a man. He wasn't saying this is how I as God relate to the Father as God. I mean... There's a lot of truth in that. He's saying, this is how I as a man filled with the Spirit relate to the Father. The Father's in me. I'm in the Father. And he goes on in verse 20 in John, John 14. He says, and I'm going to be in you and you're going to be in me like I'm in the Father and the Father's in me. We're in this in a supernatural way with intimacy. And that's what he's calling the, the church to. Paragraph C, this union of the Father being in the Son and the Son being in the Father. Again, we looked at a little bit of the details of that in session 7 and 8 and all that's on the website. And then us being in Jesus and Jesus being in us, the fruit of that throughout John chapter 14, number one, we're going to look at it tonight, the very first application is he says, you'll do miracles. You'll operate actually in greater works than these. I find it very interesting. That's the very first application Jesus gave 
when he laid out the relationship of being in the Father and the Father in him and him in us, he said, I want you to know this is real. This is where it's going. The works that I do, you'll do, and actually greater works than these. That's the actual first statement of application he gave to the disciples. I thought, well, that's a pretty big beginning application point. Of course, that's going to happen in fullness in those final years leading up to his return. We'll get to that in a few moments. Then the fruit of the union is not only the great miracles, but it's answered prayer. It's this deep partnership with his heart. It will result in obedient love, enjoying God's manifest presence. And I just broke that down a little bit, and we'll break it down week by week as the Lord permits. Okay, let's look at Roman numeral two. Well, now he's going to give the very first application to what he has said in John 14, verses 1 to 11. He says, here's where it starts. Here's how you're going to relate to the Father like I relate to the Father in my humanity. He says in verse 12, I mean, these words are so big that it's really easy to just set them aside and really not engage in them. But Jesus is telling us this is real. This isn't poetry or symbolism. He goes, he that believes in me, verse 12, meaning interacts with me like I do the Father. More than just the casual uh, mental assent, we believe you're God and thank you that you forgave us and it's very important to us. When he says believe in me, he's talking about that interaction that he's just described in verse 7 to 11 that we've looked at in the last two sessions. He goes, the works that I do, he'll do them also. He says, but it's going beyond that. Greater works than these shall they do. Shall this person do? Because I go to the Father, and the point is, and I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. Then in verse 13, he says, whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it. So that the Father is glorified in me doing this when you ask. If you ask anything in my name, and that's the key phrase, in my name, I will do it. Now Jesus is telling them, I'm going to answer your prayers. Now he gives very clear conditions. And it starts off in verse 12, he that believes in me. And again, the context is these, they're interacting with me like I interact with the Father. So it's, a, it's more than, again, just the casual kind of introductory confidence in Jesus as our Savior. It's talking about this living interaction with him at the heart level. He says, I'm going to answer your prayers. And more than that, I'm going to use you to release my greater miracles. And the reason I'm doing it, it's an expression of my desire for partnership with you. Now, this is literal, though, that the saints will do greater works than these. Now, this is difficult to embrace. And in verse 16, he tells us just a few verses later, he goes, I'm praying and the Father will give you the Spirit because you're going to need the Spirit to believe and to interact with me at this level. You're not going to be able to do it, even believe this just with your natural mind. Verse 16, you're going to need the help of the Spirit to enter into this. Then in verse 26 of this same chapter, he says, the Spirit's going to teach you these things. He will mark your heart and give you what you cannot understand without him marking your heart with living understanding. And so he's going to emphasize that, that, I mean, first he makes these dramatic statements that you just can't even grasp. And one reason it's difficult to grasp because the fullness of these statements are going to happen in a very specific time frame in those final 42 months leading up to the Lord's return. So that it comes to fullness then, but there will be more believers on the earth at that time, my guess, there'll be more believers on earth than there are believers in heaven. There'll be more of God's family on the earth in those 42 months than there is God's family in heaven. And he really means that the majority of the body of Christ is actually going to see this in that very specific time frame leading up to his appearing in the sky. And so though we see little uh, uh, expressions and kind of installments of it and down payments of it here and there through church history, the Lord has always had servants that had an, an, an uh, unusual miracle, uh, some di different ministries that have had unusual miracles throughout history, here and there. So he's always done a little bit of this for the 2,000 years. 
as you study some of the church history, but it's never been commonplace. So it's easy to write this off or to figure out some way to explain this passage away. But it's literal and it's real. And it's the first application to this dynamic relationship that the body of Christ globally is literally going to have, this dynamic relationship seen in John 17 before the Lord returns. There's going to be this massive uh, uh, invasion of the Holy Spirit and transformation of the global body of Christ. And those final months, those 42 months, I mean, even before that, but leading up to it, it really picks up the pace and uh, as, as the church uh, comes to a place of being a prepared and a mature bride. Well, he's really going to do it. You know, I've read uh, commentaries over the years, and, and it's easy. I, I, I get this. I don't say this critically. I just don't want you to dismiss this passage with this common explanation. They go, well, Jesus could preach, and he would touch multitudes, but now through television and media, we could touch millions, and that's the greater works is the mass evangelism through the technology, uh, you know, of, of television mo and, mo and modern technology, et cetera. And I say, no, I appreciate that, but that is not what he's saying. He's not saying you're going to have more people impacted through TV, if you believe me. He's actually saying you're going to do the very works that I do, and actually greater works than these. And we're going to spend time uh, uh, unpacking some of this. And again, these, as I say regularly, these six we had six pages tonight, and actually, I've got a couple more pages. I'm going to add to uh, uh, the uh, updated version of this on the Internet in a couple days, or I don't know when I'll get it, but I'm almost done with it, where I put all the miracles in the Bible and all the ones promised by the Old Testament prophets, all of them listed in a row, and this is a picture of where the end time church is going. It is, the Lord has said it so many times in the Scripture He's laid it out line by line, and just on these few pages here, we're just going to do a, a quick kind of overview of some of it, and just preparing this, my heart was just, wow, you've really, really zealous about declaring this in history, that this is what you do in the midst of your people. We're so used to it not happening, we're imagining that it won't happen, but it's going to happen on a global level. But let's go back to this uh, issue of he's calling them promising them that in a life of prayer, he's going to answer them. It's going to, prayer's going to move his heart is really what he's saying. Because he's not talking about just getting the job done of the, of the kingdom of God increasing. He's talking about the heart of his people interacting with him and the Father like he interacts with the Father. He's really talking about intimacy right now. So paragraph B, so as he sets forth this call to prayer, it's important that we understand prayer is not about informing or persuading God of anything, but it's about connecting with him in partnership and relationship. We're not telling God anything he doesn't know, and we're not like wearing him down because we're so persistent. He goes, okay, okay, stop, I'll do it. No, it's not like that. He goes, I want, I don't need the information, but I want the conversation. Because I'm a father and you're my beloved children. And Jesus would say, and you're my bride, you're my partner, you're my eternal companion forever. I want the conversation. I don't need the information, but I want you interacting with me. But we're going to withhold many things till you talk to us. Because we want your heart. That's what he's after. Jesus, paragraph B, spent whole nights in prayer to commune with the father, not so he could get more power. You know, he wasn't at 2 o'clock in the morning saying, Lord, if I go another hour, will you give me more miracles tomorrow? That's not what was happening. He was communing with the Father. We don't earn answer to prayer through pers persistence in prayer. But rather through persistence in prayer, we position ourselves. We position our cold hearts to be before, I call it that bonfire of God's presence. And our cold heart, it softens and falls out and it gets tenderized. By persistence, we position ourselves to grow in that transforming union that Jesus just described in verse uh, 7 to 11. He just got through laying it out the way that he interacts with the Father. Paragraph C, Jesus said, ask. And we know the verse in James 4 too. You have not because you ask not. And God knows all of our needs. Jesus said that in Matthew 6. He goes, he knows it all. He's not looking for information. 
but he requires that you engage in conversation with him. And he's going to hold back things till you do. And we'll, we'll persevere many times because we, we want things. And he'll hold off because he wants the conversation. He wants our heart. And eventually we go, wow, you know, those things are great. But we're surprised, surprised. Wow, we're, we're communing with you. We never knew it was going to be like this. I remember, I, I remember it was 40 years ago almost, 1983. I first moved to Kansas City and we had that solemn assembly at 21 days in May of 1983. And the Lord spoke audibly, 24-7 prayer in the spirit of the tabernacle of David with singers and musicians. And I remember we had daily prayer meetings as we started the church, I mean, right at 40 years ago. And we had prayer meetings every day. And, and when the Lord said 24-7 prayer, I went bah humbug. I didn't go, wow. People said, it must have been amazing. No, it wasn't. I said, Lord, the truth be known, I don't like prayer. I want revival. And I will endure prayer if you promise me revival. And over time, I went, wait a second, I want revival, but I discovered something I didn't understand. This is really where it's at. And the Lord surprised me. He ambushed me. He surprised me with joy. As C.S. Lewis uh, coined that phrase, surprised with joy, I went, wait, I was enduring, boring God so I could have good revival. And I found out that boring God was very dynamic and fascinating, and though I really want revival, we're going to be walking in this re prayer relationship forever and forever, unrelated to revival. They cry out and worship night and day around the throne, not because they want revival around the throne, because they're fascinated with a person, with the Father, and with the Son at the right hand. Asking causes us to connect with his heart. And when we ask, Lord, would you do this? And that specific blessing comes, and we connect it with asking and then we go, wait a second, I needed that financial breakthrough specifically. I needed that healing specifically. I needed that open door specifically, and it came specifically. Wait, you are moved by what I say. And the Lord goes, you're getting it. That's why I want you to connect it. If you say the prayer, then you more, you're more likely to connect it when I answer it, that it's my heart is moved by you. Wow. I mean, I've had, like you have, many of you had, many specific prayers answered. The idea that the transcendent, uncreated God is moved by my words, I go, this is remarkable. This is like amazing. And the Lord says, you just don't even know where this is going. I love you more than you can imagine. Paragraph D, he says, pray in my name. That's that doesn't mean add the verbal phrase in the name of Jesus, although we do that for sure. But it, to pray in my name means to pray in a way that he can endorse it. That's what he means by in my name. Pray in a way that agrees with my leadership and expresses my heart. That's how you pray in my name. And I believe in saying, and we ask in the name of Jesus. I mean, I, I'm good. I love to do that. But it's more than verbalizing a request. Some people go, he said anything we want. In his name, he goes, anything you want, ask me, and if I can endorse it, and if it's in agreement with my leadership, not just what I will do, but the timing and the way that I want to do it. Because the what God does, and the how he does it, and the timing that he does, it's all part of praying in his name. Typically, I want something in a certain way, in a certain time frame, like typically now, and he goes, no, I'll give it to you in my way, at my time, and I'll give it in the, maybe not how you're asking it, in a different app version of, because you don't really quite know what you're asking, but I know you, and I know the end from the beginning, and I'm committed to your heart. Paragraph E, Jesus said, and when you do this, the Father will be glorified when I answer you. The Father will be glorified. That's a, one of the primary conditions for, for answered prayer. Now, when we think of the Father glorified, some people have an skewed idea that like God is just up in heaven. He's so hungry to get the attention of everybody. And if somehow we look another way, he goes, oh, no. No, no, wait, what about me? I want all your attention. It, that's not what's moving him. He wants our full attention because he sees the glory of the love relationship. He sees the glory of what love is about. And the, when the Father is glorified, that includes he answers, and our heart is moved. We see, and we celebrate how he feels about us. Like, 
Wait, this is the kind of God you are. The discovery, the celebrating who he is and finding delight in him moves his heart. He is glorified when we find delight in how he leads us because he's a father. I love John Piper's uh, statement. He's made famous for many years that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And God is glorified. He's not saying, tell the world I flex my muscles how strong I am. He goes, no, show me and show others how we delight in one another. And my, my name is glorified in that. And my purpose is advanced in that. And so this is actually a warm and a tender phrase. It's not like a cold phrase of a distant God that wants to make sure that everybody is giving him so much credit that nobody else gets in the conversation. He goes, no, that's not it at all. I'm a, you're my family, and I, we're doing this together forever. Turn to the top of page two. Well, I'm going to be real brief on this because I've covered this so many times. But you gotta, we have to understand the context of the end time church to understand the reality of the phrase greater works than these. Because it's literal. He means it for real. And when we see what he's done and what he's promised, the miracles he's done throughout the Bible, they are down payments of what, they are seeds that are of what he's going to do in fullness. Even in this natural history before the Lord returns, he's going to bring these seed miracles to fullness. And they're going to be seen across the earth. And he's documented them from Genesis to Revelation. And this book is our reliable source of, of information of, as to what he longs to do. Not just to make our meetings more exciting. Now, he likes that. He doesn't mind that. But he wants us... Uh, interacting with his heart and people being awakened to his love and his power and his goodness through these miracles. So the family of God is going deeper and deeper together and in God, the whole John 17 prayer. Well, we know that Jesus is returning for a spiritually vibrant church that's living, walking before him as a prepared bride. I mean, that's, that is such a giant statement that the church will be a prepared bride. This is before he returns. This isn't everyone in the resurrection, the devil's in, you know, in, in prison, and we have no sin in our body, so now we're prepared. No, he goes, yeah, that, that's good, but I'm going to move in a way where you choose. I will not violate your free will. You will choose voluntarily to love me in this fallen world by the power of the Spirit because of the way I'm going to lead history. And my church will be a prepared bride before I return. I'm coming back for a prepared bride. John 17, Jesus give a hint of that. He goes, I'm going to give you glory. I'm going to release a spirit of glory. Now he gave a little bit of this glory to them uh, uh, as they witnessed uh, the power of God in his three and a half year, year ministry. And then in the early days of the book of Acts, they had a, a just a little bit of that heightened measure of glory. But this glory is going to far surpass what happened in the book of Acts. Paragraph B, the greatest revival in history, the greatest outpouring of the Spirit is yet future, far beyond the book of Acts, far beyond the book of Acts. Paragraph C, the greater works include the, uh, that generation that saw more miracles than any generation in history, the, the, the generation of Moses. That's why Moses is the template used by the prophets right through the scriptures. Moses' generation and what God did in his power is like the, the gold standard of what God's going to do in the generation he's going to return and what God did through Jesus and then in the book of Acts. Look at Micah chapter 7. This is one of my favorite uh, uh, prophetic passages in the whole Bible. The, the Spirit of the Lord says that in the days, as in the days when you came out of Egypt, I'm going to show you those miracles again. The miracles that I released to you, Israel, when I brought you out of Egypt and took you through the wilderness, you're going to see those miracles again. And that's why in a, in a couple pages, I, I'm just putting them kind of rapid fire, listing them. We're not going to read them all, but just to look at to go, wow, th this is real. But I want you to understand, he's going to do the miracles that he did in the days of Moses. And what's going to happen, verse 16, the nations will see 
and be ashamed of their might. And then on in verse 17, and they'll be afraid of the Lord. Now we think, oh, wow, that's, that's really something. The nations will see and be ashamed. Remember the context at the end of the age. Multitudes of the nations are under the leadership of the Antichrist. They have more military resource. They have more popular support. They have more state-of-the-art technology. They have more financial resource, larger armies, and they're not afraid of anyone. I mean, there's, an army is coming forth so much stronger than any empire in human history, and they will be filled with boldness, arrogant boldness. And the Lord says, when they see the miracles that I did through Moses, they will, be, they will see and they will be ashamed of their power. They would say, you know, we just got a, you know, a hundred million person army and trillions of dollars. That's all we have. You have the Genesis 1 God. And they will bow down, and it says, and they will fall down to the ground, ashamed of their might. And this will be the mightiest military resource in human history, completely broken and ashamed that they thought they were invincible when God does the miracles of Moses again. And the nations will be afraid of the Lord. Well, yeah, they will fear the Lord eventually, but this is afraid of the Lord. The afraid of the God of Israel as these miracles are unfolding. Paragraph uh, D. There'll be supernatural provision. I mean, in the days of Moses, I mean, in Moses' day, food appeared every single day from the sky for 40 years. Like, we know that story so well, it doesn't move us. Look, every single day, food came. I know the Sabbath in two days, they got, we got that. Water came out of a rock. We're not talking about a little drinking fountain. We're talking about two to three million people and cattle and livestock in a desert that's 100 degrees every day, whatever it really is, out in a desert with no shade and water, a river is flowing out of a rock day after day after day, and the rock moves with them. What? And the Lord says, when I come back, I'm going to do those miracles again. This is actual. This is greater works than these. This is not about television ministry. This is actual greater works. And the body of Christ, the global body of Christ, not, not everybody, but many will be living in this transforming union with the Lord, this deep partnership that's described in John 13 to 17 that really comes to a head in John chapter 17. There'll be supernatural protection. And, and there will be occasions and we don't know, it, I, I don't think it will, be, it will be 100%, that sort of thing, but it will be dynamic and it will be real. In the, in the days of uh, 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 Moses, when the children of Israel were in Egypt, when the judgments of the ten plagues came upon the land of Egypt and was destroying the Egyptian army and their resources and confronting Pharaoh, the Jews lived in a land called Goshen. That was one part of, of Egypt. They lived kind of, I'm sure it wasn't a very nice subdivision that they lived in. Goshen was probably really pretty bad. They were all slaves. But none of the judgments that hit the land of Egypt hit Goshen. The, the strangest one, I don't know how this works, when darkness came over the land of, of Egypt as one of the plagues, there was light in Goshen. Like, how's that work? I don't know. We'll figure that out when we get there. But, but the... We look at what happened to the slaves in Goshen and we can, we can have our holy imagination stirred as to what some of the dynamics will be to the saints in the final four, 42 months of the great, in the Great Tribulation. The Lord will be doing glorious, wonderful things in the midst of the saints at that time. And it, it, it will be glorious and wonderful. And that's why all this Moses story really is Part of the template, it's, it's the miracles of the Moses and the miracles of the book of Acts combined and multiplied on a global level. That is the context of the years leading up to the coming of the Lord when he appears in the sky. Paragraph F, read this like the first time you read it. I mean, we read this so often and I help we pray it so often. It's hard to read it with fresh eyes. That the Spirit's poured out on all flesh. Can you imagine a time when every single believer is operating in the spirit of prophecy? I mean, it says all flesh. It didn't say 
to the charismatic churches, you know, on the north end of town or something. It says, all believers that call on my name. And there's a billion believers in the earth, they say. Some say more, some say less. And a billion coming in the great harvest. Could you imagine a couple billion people where every single believer is operating in the Holy Spirit? Again, we're so used to that passage, that word all just fades away. Don't let it fade away. The, the activity of the Spirit's increasing in the church right now. Now, it's, we're not at all satisfied, but I'm telling you, uh, those of you my age, I'm 66, so I started pastoring 45 years ago. I'm telling you right now, the power of the Spirit and the amount of prophecy operating in the church is so much greater in the last 10 and 20 years than it was 30 and 40 years ago. I remember when I moved to Kansas City right at 40 years ago. I'd been a pastor for seven years in St. Louis. And I remember that somebody had a dream and a vision. And I remember saying this, that I was in a charismatic church. We worshiped, sang in the spirit, and we prophesied, you know, yea, I inhabit the praise of my people. It's kind of every week that was the same prophecy. Anyway, for the older folks, they get that. And so my point is I remember being in Kansas City 40 years ago, saying the statement, I don't know one person that's had a spiritual dream. I did not know one that I knew. And I knew lots of people. You know, I, I was a youth pastor of a group of 1,000 young people on fire for the Lord. I didn't know one person who had a dream, a prophetic dream. Now, 40 years later, I don't know of a believer that hasn't had one. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's somebody new, but almost every single believer I know has had some a whole lot, but I don't hardly know a believer that hasn't had a dream. I go, boy, have things changed in the last 40 years. So I'm encouraged, but we're not at all satisfied. But I'm telling you, from my human perspective and experience, it's really increased in 40 plus years. Really increased, but it's at the beginning of a beginning of a mass increase. Well, that's the spirit of prophecy, but let's look at verse 19, the power. Wonders in heaven, that's the sky. What? There will be wonders. There will be miracles happening in the sky and signs. I mean, the whole globe will be uh, grab their attention, and of course, we see those in the book of Revelation. There will be signs happening on the earth. Well, this is what happened in the days of Moses. Wonders in the sky and signs on the earth. In the book of Acts, they didn't have so many of those. They had more healings and appearances of angels, things like that. But uh, miracles in the created order was, was uh, kind of the main kind of miracles with Moses. And miracles in people's individual lives, healing their bodies or, or personal provision and restoration of their lives, that's more the book of Acts. But the end time revival is going to be the book of, of Exodus, Moses, and the book of Acts combined and multiplied on a global level. Look at this, verse 20, talking about signs in the, in the sky, the sun. And the moon are going to be impacted by the power of God in a way the whole earth will be arrested, their attention. This will happen before, before the great day of the Lord. This is not afterwards. This is before Jesus comes in the sky. And we get, there's a little sign here and there. I mean, the Lord's done a little bit of that, but nothing like it's going to. Now notice verse 20. The great and awesome day of the Lord. There's quite a few passages in the scripture that talk about the day of the Lord. And, and many commentators agree that the day of the Lord is the final three and a half years of this age. And it includes the thousand year, the one day that's like a thousand years, the millennial kingdom, includes the whole thing. Others say it only includes the final 42 months. Some say it only includes the, 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 the millennial kingdom, the day that's like a thousand years. My feeling is it includes the final 42 months and the 1,000 years, something like that. Whatever it is, it will include uh, 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 the day of the Lord in this passage would be the millennial kingdom when he comes. That's what it would appear that the Lord uh, uh, um, uh, stands in the sky. But notice what Jesus said in Luke chapter 17 I think it's a very tender, emotional statement that he made, meaning it moved him, and, and the guys that he said it to didn't even get it. He says, as it was in the days of Noah in the future, so it's going to be that way in the days of the Son of Man. Not the day. The days. Now, the day of the Lord, again, when you take all of the passages, 
There's a 24-hour day of the Lord when he appears in that 24-hour period. Then there's that long period, like the thousand-year reign, a thousand years like a day. There's the longer, the greater day of the Lord, and there's the narrow 24-hour day of the Lord. Both of those are described in the Scripture. But Jesus is saying, I'm not talking about the day of the Lord, even that 24-hour period. He says, I'm talking about those days where I am especially magnified in the eyes of the nations. This is before before he appears in the sky. There's this phrase that he used that you never hear it talked about because it's kind of like you go by it real fast. Wait, Wait a second. He goes, It will be like the days of Noah, my days, where I will have my way with my church on the earth. My days. And this is a different, this is a subunit of the bigger subject of the day of the Lord. You know, the larger one that's, whether it's a thousand years or however you add it up. Or whether it's the 24-hour period, there's those days where Jesus has his way with his church even before he appears in the sky. The days of the Lord. Revelation chapter 11, I'm just going to add a little bit more to this. He, he gives kind of the, the, kind of the ultimate demonstration of power in human beings in Revelation 11, verse 3 to 6. He talks about the two witnesses. He goes, I'm going to give power to two witnesses. And they are, they're going to, for 42 months, for 42 months, three and a half years, they're going to be able to call power down from heaven. They'll be able to call fire down from heaven. They'll be able to shut down the rain and cause a drought. They'll turn water into blood. They'll strike the earth with plagues. These guys under Jesus' leadership will release miracles, I believe, that will far surpass even what Moses did. And so Jesus, these are his days where he gets his way in his days and the earth is arrested with him even before he comes and cast the devil into prison, even in natural history, these are his few, uh, I mean, this, this small amount of days, and that's uh, my interpretation of that phrase, the days of the Son of Man, plural. Paragraph G. Well, the miracles in Scripture, I've already said this, are seeds, I'm talking about Old and New Testament, are seeds of Jesus' power. The power of Jesus that will be seen in fullness. In the days of the Son of Man. And again, in my interpretation of that, it's those final 42 months is the epicenter of those days of the Lord when he appears in the sky. These miracles, and there's hundreds and hundreds of them, they inform our paradigm, our perspective. They inform our holy imagination of what the future will look like when the power of God is operating in fullness in his people. I read these, that's why I'm giving you so many of these verses, and I'm going to add a few more pages because I just didn't want to put it all in a print here and and have it uh, handed out. I'm up here on the internet. When you see, I mean, the list is bigger and bigger. I look at this, I go, Lord, this this is fantastic. And I just imagine the Lord smiling going, I'm going to see this in the midst of my people even before this natural history is over. This is going to happen on the earth. It's called fullness. And I believe the miracles of Jesus that he did in his ministry, the miracles of Jesus, they're still his miracles, done through Moses, done through the book of Acts, they are seeds. They are prophetic statements. They they give prophetic insights. They're down payments of an end-time revival where there's one season in natural history, there's one season where the Spirit moves in fullness in the global body of Christ. And again, it's in context of that final 42 months, that final three and a half years before the Jesus appears in the sky. Now look here in Ephesians 4. And there's like 10 verses in the New Testament that talk about fullness. The word fullness is such a big word. It so stretches our imagination. We're just thinking, what, whatever. Fullness, what? But here uh, Paul says, Verse 11, Ephesians 4, and I just edited it down just to make it fit on the page better. You'll read the whole, t- the whole passage on your own. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, pastors, ev- evangelists, pastors, and teachers. They're going to equip the saints. Verse 13, until we all come to the unity, that's John 17, the knowledge of the Son of God, that's intimacy, to the maturity, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The fivefold ministry is operating until we all, like 
all? Like, Paul, really all? all? Do you really actually mean all? Do you mean some? I think he meant all. The body of Christ has a measure of maturity that reflects the fullness of Christ. Like, what? And the fivefold ministry will be equipping the saints for ministry till that happens. So some people say there are no apostles, prophets. They are, everyone knows there's pastors and teachers and evangelists. And I go, well, until the church has this level of maturity, they're operating. I don't, I'm not big on using all the titles. But they got to be somewhere and emerging. And, and I'm not one to try to figure out who they are. Lots of guys, which doesn't bother me. It's everyone's own way with God. They define them and who they are and who they're not. I'm not concerned with that. I just, I know the Lord is releasing them and raising them up. And I believe in the next 10, 20 years, we're going to see a lot more clarity. But I'm not interested in titles and terms. I'm re- interested in the impact of verse 13. Until we all come, the body of Christ, to a measure of maturity together that expresses the fullness of what? That hurts my brain to say that the fullness of Jesus. Paul, come on. Is this real? Well, there's about 10 more fullness verse, verses in the New Testament. And, and they're very moving, but it, it, just, it just kind of boggles the mind to even look at that and think, really? And the Lord's saying, yeah, there's a season of fullness coming that a lot of believers aren't thinking about. They've, it's all through the Scripture. They just, it's never connected with them, but it will before it's over. I'm going to connect this to them. I'm, I, I'm, I'm sensing the Lord is, I have confidence in the Lord. Millions and millions are going to connect with this. He talks about Israel. He says there's blindness in Israel until the fullness of the Gentile believers, till the, the Gentile believers come to full number, yes, which, you know, is the billion soul harvest, but they come to full maturity where they express the fullness of Christ. There's a season of fullness that's yet coming. In paragraph H, uh, Peter said, when you're reproached or you're persecuted, let's put the word persecuted, for Jesus, you're blessed. Because when you're persecuted for Jesus, there's an increase of the spirit of glory that rests on you. And so in the great tribulation, that will be the hour of the greatest persecution, and thus it will be the hour of the greatest measure of the spirit of glory on the church. And I believe that the final 42 months of this age is the church's greatest hour. And I I understand a lot of people believe the church won't be here. This will be the greatest hour for the church and the billion soul harvest and the church coming to full maturity with the spirit of glory resting on them. It's uh, I, I like what uh, uh, Asher and Trader says. I've, he said it 30 years ago. I've been laughing about it for 30 years. He goes, if I'm wrong and we're raptured before this, he goes, I am not going up. I'm staying down. <laughs> I said, I don't think it works that way. He goes, I'm not missing the end time harvest. Are you kidding me? Of all the nations, that's what I've labored my whole life for. Anyway, I just thought I'd throw that in there. It's kind of fun. It was cute. Okay, top of page three. Well, let's look at Jesus at greater works than what I did. Well, let's look at what he did. And we're just going to look at a few of these. There's about 40 miracles recorded in the four Gospels. Interesting, the only miracle that's mentioned by all four Gospels is the multiplying of food. I think this is so significant. And Jesus did it twice. He did it with 5,000, told in all four Gospels. Then he did it with 4,000. And he multiplied food. Moses had multiplication of food. Elijah had multiplication of food. The multiplication of food happens a surprising number of times through the Old Testament. And, and we won't look at it all, but I've got a, the list there. And I've got more on an extended list that I'll be uh, uh, putting on the Internet pretty soon. But Jesus uh, fed 5,000 from the five loaves of the two fishes. And so the Revelation 13, verse 17 says that when the mark of the beast system is, in, is uh, established, and it's a literal system, and the Antichrist is a literal person, though there is a spirit of the Antichrist as well, that's been operating throughout church history, the spirit of the Antichrist, but there is an actual Antichrist, an actual system called the mark of the beast, and people who don't take the mark of the beast will not be allowed to buy or sell, and I believe the Lord says, trust me. They're not going to starve. They will be there with a vibrant spirit when I return. They didn't die of starvation. I've got plans you know not of. I really believe it. Because a lot of folks say, if we don't have the mark of the beast, what's going to happen? I go, well, you know one thing. 
When Jesus comes, the church is walking in maturity. So they didn't all die of starvation. So something happened. And he's such a good leader, I'm not concerned about it. Okay, the miracles of Jesus reported in three Gospels, which gives you a little bit more emphasis of the Spirit is saying, I'm emphasizing these more. And, I mean, the healing of paralytics, the raising of the dead, the calming of storms. Storms are going to be calmed by the Word of God spoken in power. Storms in various places will be stopped. Jesus walked on water. Believers will walk on water, not every time, every, any time and every time. I wouldn't just do it any time, but uh, then we will hear stories of this. I've read uh, some revival stories uh, in different places. I remember, I don't want to get into the details, where actually some people walked across the river and then they were blown away. The food multiplied in Asia and, and under great persecution. And they thought, wait, what? I go, yeah, but Jesus said we would do what he did. It's, it's not very common right now. And I don't mean it will be so common where it's like nonchalant happens to everybody every day, but it will be in the storyline and the conversation of the global body of Christ. Paragraph C, miracles reported in two Gospels. Well, the 4,000s reported in two Gospels. This, again, the, if it's reported in all four, it has a high emphasis of the Spirit. Reported in three, that's, there's a message in the amount of, uh, of how often it's reported. I mean, if it makes one line in the Word of God, it's important. But when it's said over and over, and the Spirit orchestrated it, I mean, uh, that we have here the, the demon cast out of the Canaanite woman, and the centurion's servant is healed. Now, remember, the Canaanite and the, the, the centurion, that's a Roman, these were historic enemies of Israel. They would be today what Islam would be to Israel. So amongst Islamic Middle East nations, powerful miracles are happening before they even believe in the Lord being done by the body of Christ. So when I see that, I go, I see a down payment of, and, and it's way beyond just the Middle East, but these are Canaanite and Roman centurion. These are, these are people that are hostile to Israel. And yet God is giving miracles to them before they're born again, before they believe in Jesus. The miracles are happening. Then we have some uh, in, in Matthew, miracles that are unique only to Matthew. Peter walks on water. Well, we know Jesus does. Now we know Peter does. That's going to happen in the end time church. There's going to be storms. There's going to be upheaval in weather and roaring seas. And yet there's going to be supernatural dimension. Again, not everybody every time, but it's going to be more than one here, one there. It's going to be part of the global conversation of the body of Christ. Well, so you don't have any money. Well, if there's a coin in the mouth of a fish. How did that get in there? Was Jesus just showing off? No, Jesus is making a statement. He goes, I've got it all thought through. All of his signs and wonders, in my opinion, even the others in the Old Testament, they're prophetic down payments, they're statements, they're seeds of what will happen in fullness. And so I don't know how often and where, but if it's in the book, I'm going for it. I'm going, Lord... If my holy imagination is stirred by the written word of God. I don't want to stand at a distance and just say, well, whatever. I'm just going to sink away in my despair. Because Jesus starts the chapter here in chapter 14. He goes, let your heart, don't let your heart be troubled. Then he describes the intimate relationship. This is the first application. Greater works than these. In the body of Christ, we easily go, oh, whatever. And, and the Lord might say, no, ask the Holy Spirit. Verse 16 and verse 26. Ask the Spirit to help you gain living understanding. Let the Spirit stir up your understanding even of the Scripture. I don't understand much, but I want to understand more. I say, thank you, Lord. I buy this. I'm going for this. I want to see, not just wait till then to see it, because whatever happens in fullness in that time is happening in part right now and in, in, and in an increasing man manner. Whatever's happening in fullness related to his appearing is happening in part and yet in an increasing manner right now. So it's not like we're waiting till then to see this. I'm saying, Lord, this is what you do. Uh, it will be m much more prevalent then, but this is what he's willing to do. You just don't know when it's going to happen. Miracles uh, related to uh, uh, unique to Luke. 
And I mean, he, Jesus is in an angry crowd. They're going to throw him off a cliff. But the Spirit of God helps him escape. That's going to happen again. Peter's net is full of fish. Supernaturally, the Spirit moves. So, okay, you can't buy or sell. Guess what? Go fishing. Peter cuts off the ear of the enemy, of the servant of the people against them, and God heals the enemy's servant. And the Lord says, I'm still who I am. Don't be shocked if you see me do this again through your hands someday, these sort of things. These are just pictures and seeds of, of miracles that, that will happen. Paragraph G, miracles unique to John, turning water into wine. Raising Lazarus from the dead, four days. The fish again, 153 fish. He threw the net over on the other side. And he got 153 fish. Like, these are real miracles that have messages in them. Well, in, in um, uh, AI, miracles associated with Peter, the one I, I'm going to mention here is the two times he's in prison at the end of the list here. He's in prison twice, and an angel appears and opens the door. And at the very end, he's in prison in Rome and he dies. So, but you never know when you're in prison, is this today? Is it not today? The Lord says, I will do this. And we have stories of even the, uh, believers in the underground church in China where prison doors have opened by angelic intervention. Top of page four. I'm just going to just put a few more of these. Miracles with Paul. They're amazing. <laughs> I, mean, they're, I, I love these. <laughs> Well, when Jesus appeared to Paul, remember, Paul is, a, is intense in his zeal to injure the church with violence and death and imprisonment. In today's world, he was, he was enemy number one against the church. In today's world, he would be called a terrorist. I mean, he was killing and imprisoning every Christian he could, and the Lord appears to him. The stories we've heard from multitudes of, of Muslims is they say the man in white appears to them in a dream. Well, the stories are being told over and over and over again. The man in white is what the, many of them say. And has the Lord appeared to this, what we would call a terrorist today, and called him to himself, I mean the most hardened person can be turned in one moment. And the miracle in Paul's life is a picture of that. And I believe we're going to see that. There are some of these top leader, gang leaders, these top, not gang leaders is one, terrorist leaders is two. Some of these are young apostles and prophets that are one revelation away from changing over to the kingdom of God. They got incredible leadership gifts. A lot of, of, of the Lord has prepared them, and when he shifts them over, they will do damage to the kingdom of darkness. So I don't care who that guy is. He's one dream away from stepping over the line. Well, Paul did miracles, so many miracles, right in the middle of the list here. He prayed for handkerchiefs, and they would take the handkerchiefs, go lay them on some demonized person, and the demon would come out. This stuff is going to happen again. Par paragraph K, other miracles in Acts. Stephen, he's a deacon. Stephen Philip is a deacon. I mean, there, he's translated 20 miles, 30 miles down the road. He's preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch, and he's picked up and translated about 25, 20, 30 miles away, and he's then preaching to someone else. This is going to happen again. Okay, top of page, middle of page four. It's kind of, I really like the Moses stuff. Well, I like the Jesus stuff. I, I like it all. This is documented because the end time revival is the Moses story is a template. It's not the complete template. It's part of the template in the book of Acts and the Gospels is the other part of the template of where the end time church is going. Water turned into blood. In other words, when uh, uh, in terms of opposing Pharaoh, there's an end time Pharaoh. His name, he's called the Antichrist. And there's an end time Pharaoh that's going to be confronted with the end time ten plagues of Egypt. Those are found in the book of Revelation. And you'll find that many of the judgments in the book of Revelation are parallel to the ten plagues of Egypt because it's the Moses story told again. It's meant to be parallel. So when you read the ten plagues, then you read the seven trumpets, the seven bowls, you go, wait, many of these are similar. 
And, and, and the Lord might say is that's why they sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb around the throne because it's the Moses story done on a global level, not on a local level, just in Egypt. Well, there's multiplication. This is to stop and, and to hinder the resources of Pharaoh, which in the end time scenario, to hinder the resources of the Antichrist, multiplication of frogs. I don't want to be near that or lies ooh, or flies or boil. I don't want to be near any of this. I just... I want to pray and release it to stop the Antichrist resources. Look at the splitting the Red Sea. There's a number of passages, like in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 15, that the bodies of water are going to be split again. And we'll have that on, on the larger notes uh, that I'll have on the Internet soon, where several times bodies of water, like the Jordan River, are divided, the Euphrates River, the, the Gulf of, of Suez, or the Gulf of Egypt, it's going to be uh, uh, hit by the Lord again, like the, like the Red Sea was, and it's going to be split. The Lord says, I'm going to do it all again. You wait and see. I'm going to do it again and way more. Paragraph M, miracles in the wilderness, bitter water. We want bitter water healed. That's fantastic. Bread coming from the sky. It's good, too. Water coming from a rock. So there's fresh water coming from a rock where there is no water, and there's bitter water that's healed. All kinds of, uh, Balaam, an, an animal prophesying at the very end here, Balaam's donkey. <laughs> Paragraph N, the Jordan River divides. When we get the whole list, I want to add up. I don't have them all, the numbers yet. How many times rivers were divided in history? How many times food was multiplied? How many times water was healed or supernaturally released where there was no water? It happens quite a number of times. Oh, fantastic. Paragraph, oh, I'm looking at these. I love these stories. Elijah multiplies food again, raises someone from the dead. Fire comes down on the false prophets. A drought is caused. The rains come by his word. The Jordan is, is split again. And this is strange when Elijah, here he is, he's, 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 he's been praying for the rain. The Spirit of God comes on him. He outruns King Ahab in his chariot. Well, I just see that, that hit you. Have you outrun that chariot? I mean, like, what? How did that get in the book? The Lord says, just, you wait and see. A little bit that's going to happen. Like, hmm, wow. wonder how, when, and why, and where. Okay, top of page five. Elisha, he divides the river again. Elisha, he bitter waters healed again. Elisha, he, supernatural water is provided. Oil is multiplied. The dead is raised again. Stew that's poisonous is healed and made where it's edible. Loaves of bread multiply again. Here's one. An iron axe head falls into the river and it floats to the top. Because they needed it in order for, to fulfill what God had told them to do. They go, oh no, the equipment's broke. The Lord says, watch this. And the axe came to the surface again. The army, the enemy army attacking are struck blind, all of them, in one moment. Well, this is strange. Well, they, they all are. Elijah's bones. Some guy falls down. They take a corpse and put him on in, in a grave. Elisha was born, uh, buried there, and the guy wakes up. I mean, he, he gets raised from the dead. Like, what? How did that get on the list? <laughs> Paragraph Q, 185,000 Assyrians were killed in one night by an angel. There may be massive armies and battalions that are ready to, for an area, and they might all die in one night. It's happened several times in the Old Testament. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, the lion's den. Top of page five. I want to be clear, and you can read this on your own. Satan will have miracles. But I want to say this. The, the reason I, I'm putting this in here is that a lot of folks, they think, well, the miracles. No, the miracles are critical because Satan is going to have miracles that are going to be so convincing to many, many people. And the Lord is, paragraph A, he is a much better leader than Satan is a deceiver. And Satan has counterfeit miracles. Read them on your own. The Lord's not leaving the church in a vacuum. 
I know some folks, and, and I say this with a, with a heart of honor and tenderness, but that are cessationists. They believe miracles passed away. And some of them I've talked to, they double down on this, and, and they love Jesus, and so I'm sure the Lord will fix it. But they're so into there are no miracles but only demonic ones that any time there's a miracle, their conclusion is it has to be demonic. And I'm sure the Lord will shift that when they get a dream to pray for one of their children and they're sick and their children get healed. They're going to say, oh, well, there you go. I guess miracles do work today. But there's a, quite an emphasis of demonic miracles happening, but the real miracles will be more powerful. Paragraph D, God's people will be able to, to discern between the two. It won't be confusing. It's very, very simple principles. And, and John will talk about that at another time. But some people go, oh, I'll be confused. No, if they will say Jesus is Lord and they honor the written word of God and they refuse this, when they stumble in disobedience, they rise up and repent. If they're living in a spirit of obedience, that means they, when they sin, they attack it and they war against it. They honor the written word of God. They declare and worship Jesus as Lord and they're in godly fellowship. The youngest believer can prevail without being deceived. It's not complicated to do it. But you live with a spirit of disobedience. You don't believe the word of God is the final authority of faith and, and practice. You don't say Jesus is Lord, but he's one of the top leaders, but not the Lord. You're, you're vulnerable to a whole lot of deception. Paragraph six. I mean, page six. Well, it's paragraph six too. I see the most dramatic miracles in human history are still yet in the future. I see the book of Revelation. I call it the end time book of Acts. The book of Revelation. I see the book of Revelation again. It's the miracles of Exodus and the miracles of the book of Acts combined and multiplied on a global level. I, I see the book of Revelation not just as the end time book of Acts because the judgments are against the Antichrist. They're against the end time Pharaoh. These are the judgments that when Pharaoh was was his resources were destroyed by the plagues of Egypt, the, the, the believers were rejoicing. They said, wow, God's on our side. God's helping us. The book of Revelation, it's the negative is mostly about the destruction of the Antichrist empire. You don't read the book of Revelation and go, oh, no. You look at the book of Revelation and say, the end time book of Acts. This is amazing. This way outdoes what Moses did. I call it also the, a canonized prayer manual. What do I mean by that? When the second trumpet happens, and there's a billion saints on the earth, guess what always comes after the second trumpet? The third one. And a billion saints will know what the next judgment against the Antichrist is. What happens after the third trumpet? A billion people go, number four comes after number three. They're all praying and releasing it. Then number five comes after number four. It's a canonized prayer manual. Canonized means it's inspired. We know ahead of time not all the things that God's doing against the Antichrist, but some of the, the key ones, and the saints will be engaged in prayer. Paragraph B, you can read this on your own, but in Revelation 8, an angel has incense up in heaven, heavenly incense, and the prayers of the saints are arising from the earth, and he's putting this heavenly incense on them, combining the heavenly incense with the prayers of the saints, and then the angel throws fire down when the prayers of the saints ascend. So the prayers of the saints in the end time church are arising in the, from the earth to heaven, and they're connected to Satan, uh, to uh, the angel throwing fire against Satan's works in the kingdom of darkness. Psalm 149, with the high praises of God, or call it prayer and worship. God's going to execute vengeance in, on the Antichrist empire, on the nations that are following his leadership. What vengeance is going to be uh, released? Verse 9. They're going to execute the vengeance that's written down in the word of God. It's in Isaiah. It's in Exodus with Moses. It's in the book of Acts. It's in the book of Revelation. The judgments are already written, and the praying, worshiping saints will be releasing these, Psalm 149, this is the earthly side of what we just read in Revelation 8. That's the heavenly side. It's the prayers of the church, the prayers of the saints crying out, and the prayers of Jesus, and the holy incense of heaven, the heavenly incense mixed together, and the prayers of the martyrs under the altar in Revelation 6. They all come together, and the fire is released against the Antichrist kingdom. 
Paragraph D, and, and we have these 21 different judgments. They're against the harlot Babylon, particularly the, the, the seven seals, and then against the Antichrist resources and the harlot Babylon. So these are, but look at some of these. Look at the trumpets. The vegetation is burned. Again, this is the vegetation that's a resource of the Antichrist. The sea turns to blood. That, that, that hinders his uh, navigation and military movements and goods moving. The water becomes bitter. Saints are going to be causing bitter water to become clean and clean water to become bitter through the prayers of the saints together under Jesus' leadership. The sun and the moon are impacted. Demonic locuses. Let's look down to bowls. Sores come on Antichrist worshiper. Blood, the sea turns to blood again like Moses did. The water turns to blood like Moses. Scorching heat, pain on the Antichrist empire, etc., etc., etc. My point is this. We have, worship team, come on up. We have this glorious leader. His name is Jesus. He says, I've got a plan. It's already written in the book. The, exec, the judgments are already written that will be executed against the end time Pharaoh, which is the Antichrist. And my church is going to be a mature bride. My church is going to be in a unity of the measure of the stature that expresses the fullness of Christ. And Jesus said, if you walk in this union, John 14, where we started, the very first thing he said is, you'll be doing greater works than I did. You wait and see. There's a greater work season coming. And little here and there, they happen through history. You don't wait till then. But they're going to become far more prevalent in one season of history. And I'm using the phrase from uh, uh, Luke 17, 26, in the days of the Son of Man, when it's his day and the whole earth is having in conversation about this man releasing this power. Many will hate him. Many more will love him. The days of the Son of Man. And the, well, that's what it's going to be like in the generation the Lord returns. Well, amen and amen. <laughs> that's what you call rapid fire. I did rapid fire tonight. <laughs> but I loved it. <laughs> Let's stand before the Lord. Let's ask you for miracles now because we're not waiting for, you know, the Big Bang Theory. Like, let's just wait, sit on our hands, and then one day, miracles. Will... No, there's miracles happening right now. They're increasing all over the earth. Not as rapid as we want, but a lot faster than they were before. I tell you that for sure. Father, here we are before you. Lord, we, we say we believe the Word of God. And we ask for the Holy Spirit to help us. Help us. I, my mind can't grab this, Holy Spirit. Teach me. Help me. John 14, verse 16 and 26. Help me. Get this. Help me see the future through your lens. So our hearts are not troubled. We don't have to be troubled. The future's in your hands, Lord. I want to ask anybody in, in, in here who's sick in your body, you would like prayer, raise your hand. Anyone, just anybody sick in your body. Keep your hand up high, okay? I want the other folks around. We're going to turn around. I'm going to pray. You're going to pray too. But you don't have to pray real loud. You don't even have to say a lot. But it's the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and feel free to walk away from your, your seat. If somebody's like 10 feet away, just go ahead and walk on over there. I tease and say there, there, there's, there's no railings on those aisles. You can, this is a big living room. So just walk across the room. And someone's got their hand up, just lay your hand on them. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus for miracles tonight, right now. I ask for miracles tonight. And I speak to their body. This is my fire. This is my song. Let the fire of the Holy Spirit right touch them right now. With all that I have Father, we want to be in that conversation with you greater works than these miracles. Even now, we want to see them, more of them now, even in this hour. Tonight. Tonight, Lord. Before my heart, my soul, and my mind I pour out and all We love your word, Jesus. We want to believe in you like you say in John 14. We want to believe in you in this way, Lord. This is my prayer. Father, release your creative power. I just speak to sickness and bodies right now. 
And I say the name of Jesus. Miracles. Lord, we ask you tonight. As our hearts are even stirred about your leadership with miracles. Tonight, Lord. I ask for an increase in the prophetic spirit tonight. I ask for dreams and visions to rest on this community. Those that are visiting, when they go back home to an open heaven, where dreams increase in the next weeks, you said all flesh, every believer would prophesy. Release the spirit of grace and the spirit of power across this room. We don't have to try to make anything happen. It's our weak hands and our weak words. And all we need to say is what he says and trust him. And he does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants. But he wants our hands to be laid on people. And he wants us to at least whisper the words. To at least say them. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Power. Fire. Fire. Power. Touch their bodies. Our weak words and our weak hands. But your power tonight. city in this nation, on campuses, in the Middle East, in Israel, Lord, an increase of the spirit of revival on the saints. Spirit, we recognize your presence. Testify, Testify of Jesus and his glory tonight in this room. Make him known in this room tonight. We're asking for miracles. Reveal your nature, your power. Father, reveal your nature and your power tonight. Thank you, Lord, we ask you for more. Surprises tonight Surprise with your glory. Us. Thank you, Abba. And we ask you for more. Come surprise us with your glory. Come and surprise us tonight with your we glory. We thank you. Greater works than Lord, these. Lord, we ask you for more. Come surprise us with your glory, oh Lord. We thank you. And we ask you for more. Come surprise us with your glory. Presence tonight, right now. We are the 
magnify Jesus. Heal bodies. Release fire upon hearts and lives tonight. Come reveal your power and love. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you've done. Do more tonight. There's a couple areas that I felt the Lord highlight tonight and He wants to specifically touch. There is someone here you have uh, in the small of your back, kind of really lower back towards your tailbone, towards your pelvis, uh, hip area. There's real a lot of tension and problems in there. Is there anybody here that has that? Just right here in the front, right here and there. Just if you're in that category, just raise your hand, have some people pray for you. There's somebody else here, you have migraines, headaches. They manifest like almost like a pinprick or a drill or something right in the front of your head on a sharp point and then spread out from there. And it's like migraines, headaches, that sort of thing. There's another over here, over well, there in the back. It, it is one of those two. Just come on up here. Let's do Yes, it. there's a bunch of people over come here. Come on up here. front. Yeah, if you need so prayer, make sure that people those. get lay hands on you. There's somebody else here. You have a hamstring injury that has kind of from the butt all the way down to your knee kind of problem, like your hamstring. Somebody has a hamstring problem. If you're here, just raise your hand so we can pray for you. And then lastly, this and is let's go a little slower. Yeah. Come on up quickly if you are any of those. Or you're just saying, no, I'm just desperate to get some prayer for healing tonight. No one's mentioned it, but I'm just, just come on up anyway. Hey, and come stand up on the front line here so the folks behind you can have room. Yeah, there you go. We always fill up the front line first. Yeah, there you go. And lastly, I felt, and I've never felt anything like this, so I'm just gonna go for it and see what happens. It felt like a late, like a, a sluggish eye, like your the muscles in your eye not uh, working not as properly as they should, and it feels like your eyes moving sluggish in your eye socket. I don't know if you actually have a lazy eye, but that's just how it felt in my brain. So if anybody is here like that, you have an eye right in the front here. Anybody else? You have problems with your eyes specifically. And I want a bunch of folks to we'll come and pray spot. for folks. Yeah, if you're in the room. I encourage you to even stand in front of them so they can hear you. You talk to them a little bit. You don't have to stand in front, but you tend to communicate a little bit better to, with them. doesn't matter where you stand. but it, So you can ask them how they're doing, how they're feeling. Lord, come and visit. Just anyone in the room that wants to pray for folks, go ahead and come on up. Yes, right now. Yeah, there's more people that need prayer. So if you are an intern or a student coming up right now, right, is the, right now is the time to practice. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for, for your angels that release healing. Angels that minister to Jesus right now. Oh, Lord, release your power now. Release your power. Release your healing your power. ministry. Feel free to move around or pray for people for a few minutes and then go pray for someone else. Jesus walking Again, you don't have to be stuck in one spot. We're just a living room together, just a family in a living room. Just Touch move their around. bodies. In Jesus' name we pray. We say no more migraines. Be healed in Jesus' name. Do that I may it be weighed well. Open up the heavens Your right now. Your presence, bring that healing. We sing Jehovah, Rapha, come into this room, walk in our midst and heal Jehovah, Rapha. You're in this room, walk in our
one more word of knowledge that I felt. There's somebody here, you have gastrointestinal problems related to stress. There's ulcers or something like that, something in your stomach or your intestinal tract that you have developed some type of chronic condition in your stomach, in your, in your stomach area, an inflammation or something like that that's causing you pretty consistent pain over time. Is there anybody here like that? We would like to pray for you. Over there, anybody else? Over here? Let's lay hands on them. Let's believe. If the Lord's highlighting those people, He wants to touch them with power today. Father, we thank You. Increase Your presence. We thank You for what You've already done. Any urinal tract infections right now, in Jesus' name, heal them right now. In the name of Jesus, come and touch the body. Pass us by, son of David.
Oh.